Good evening and welcome to Casio's webinar series on equity in education. My name is Amy Chow and I am Casio's National Training and Product Manager. As a long-standing member and supporter through scholarships of both the TOTOS and the Benjamin Banneker Association, Casio is proud to partner with them in these important discussions. The title for today's webinar is Restoring Indigenous Identities in Mathematics from Land-Based Pedagogies, Implications for Black and Brown Communities. We are honored to have Dr. Filiberto Barajas Lopez presenting tonight. For the sake of webinar quality, we are keeping everyone muted and all videos turned off except for the presenter. If you have a question or comment, please type it in the chat panel and make sure to send it to everyone. We will be utilizing breakout rooms later today, later in the session, so you will be able to turn on your uh, mics and uh, your video cameras at that time if you would like. This webinar is being recorded and will be available on Casio Education's YouTube channel and TOTOS's website. Also, a certificate of attendance will be available upon request. Before we begin the session, I would like to take some time to share some ways Casio is supporting education. Casio created the Casio Cares program to support educators, parents, and students during this time of remote learning. This program gives free access to our calculator emulator software through the end of December, free online training through the end of December, and numerous free activities and videos to help support your curriculum. Casio has always provided high quality and affordable technology for everyone. Most recently, released, we released our newest graphing calculator, the FX9750G3, and our free web-based dynamic mathematics software, classpad.net, to continue to address the technology access gap and support students, parents, and teachers. As part of the Casio Cares program, we are also extending free access to classpad.net's add-on functionality of AP Statistics and CAS through the end of the year. To learn more about Casio, our Casio Cares program, calculators, or software, visit CasioEducation.com. And now Sylvia Celadon Patitius, the Vice President of TOTOS, will share their mission statement and introduce our presenter. Sylvia? Thank you. Um, so the, the, we value our partnership with Casio. Um, the, the mission of TOTOS Mathematics for All is to advocate for equity and high quality mathematics education for all students in particular Latina, Latino students. We do have a website. Um, you can see that on the left and also a Twitter account. Um, and you can follow different uh, updates through um, those, way, those means, those venues. Uh, we do have uh, membership through TODOS. Uh, we have some of these resource, our resources are freely accessible. Um, we have webinars, podcasts, resources for family, blogs. Um, we also have um, resources and um, publications, conferences, med grants, and much more. Next slide, please. Um, we, due to COVID, we postponed our face-to-face -face conference um, for the summer of 2021. Um, currently, we are planning to hold this conference virtually, so please keep um, tuned, stay tuned for more details. Um, I believe we're planning this towards the end of June. Next slide. And now it's my pleasure to welcome and introduce Dr. Filiberto Barajas Lopez. Um, he immigrated from uh, Mexico to the, to the United States, Boyle Heights, during the 1980s. He's of uh, Purepecha lineage with relationship to lands and waters in the states of Jalisco and Michoacán. He's a former diversity and mathematics education NSF fellow and earned a doctoral degree in education from UCLA. He currently serves as an associate professor in curriculum and instruction, learning sciences and human development in the College of Education at the University of Washington, Seattle, and serves as director of indigenous education initiatives and the native education certificate program. So it's my honor to introduce you, Filiberto. Thank you. Na chus na chusku cha tsikwa kimbo. Um I'd like to ask for permission of the guardians of these lands um where I'm currently connecting from 
Um, and I'd like to acknowledge the uh, Kosalish peoples and more specifically the Duwamish um, where I'm connecting from this evening. Uh, thank you all for joining um, uh, this, this afternoon, evening in some places. Um, it's an honor to have an opportunity to be able to share. Um, I wanna thank um, Todos, Casio, uh, for inviting me to share as well and to the committee, um, the president, the vice president and the committee that um, nominated me to, to be here uh, this evening uh, sharing. Um, I, I'm gonna turn on my slides briefly. Okay, so technical glitch. <laughs> All right. Um, so I th thank you. Um, I just um, was trying to get a hold of the technology here a bit. Um, I, I, I wanted to open up with those opening uh, thanks and acknowledgements. Um, also want to thank uh, one person that I missed here is um, my colleague um, who was uh, with me at the University of Washington, uh, Dr. Megan Bang, who's now at Northwestern University. Um, for, you know, that, so in many ways, a lot of what I'm sharing here is connected and related to our, our collective work that we've done over the years. Um, and I think, I, I think one thing uh, before we start as well, um, and we jump into it, I think there's a, I, I'd like to open the evening by, by contextualizing um, the moments that we're living in this time. It, it's difficult for me to kind of just jump in uh, to talk about the pertinent issues around math education uh, without acknowledging, you know, some of the moments that we're living. Um, I know that the purpose of these uh, seminars is to bring critical perspectives and understandings about how we can uh, improve mathematics learning and teaching for Black, Indigenous, and people of color in general. Um, so I want to, I, I also want to extend that, um, that if we care about improving those experiences in, in math education for Black, Indigenous, and people of color, um, that we need to take stock of the ongoing uh, realities uh, that our communities have faced both historically, uh, but also in contemporary times, um, and namely um, racism, uh, police brutality, um, and, the murdering, and the murder of black people. Um, and we, we know that you know, the, the lives of folks like George Floyd and Breonna Taylor are in the conscience of the American public and the world. Um, and, and in many ways, you know, what has happened is, is, that, um, is that these conversations have taken center stage uh, in many spaces where, where there has not been any accountability um, uh, to the lives of, of folks like uh, George Floyd and Breonna Taylor. Um, and so I think it's also, this also presents an opportunity to address the uh, realities um, in our schools and in our communities um, through our organizations and institutions. Um, and this matters more than ever. Uh, the second point I think um, I, I feel is important because it's relevant to um, all of that that I'll be sharing this evening is, um, is, is that uh, settler colonialism um, uh, continues to disrupt and shape indigenous and non-indigenous people's relationships with each other, uh, the land, water, plants, animals, and other uh, natural world uh, relations. And in part, I think what I'm sharing here uh, this evening is an attempt to kind of move some conversation towards that end. And, and, and so for the evening, um, oh, there you go. And so for, the, for this evening, um, I think uh, part of the plan is to develop uh, these four um, ideas, um, these four ideas that, <clears throat> that I've been kind of working with and thinking about um, 
in preparation for this conversation. Um, I think it's necessary that it's necessary to understand, um, you know, what it might look like to lead uh, with indigenous ways of knowing. Um, and while I can try to kind of set forth some ideas, I think, um, you know, I, I also want to be honest that that it's not going to be the full complete uh, uh, version um, that I think um, it merits. Um, but I think that within this vision of, of, um, of indigenous ways of knowing, I think there's also important openings for other non-dominant groups and communities uh, to work from. Um, so I'll open up with a short exercise uh, in where we will all engage in, in, in this exercise and, 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 and think about what it might mean to desettle mathematics uh, to address the challenges of uh, today. Um, and then I'd also like to engage a conversation about what um, might be an equity oriented aim worth pursuing. And so there's a few things I want to share with folks and kind of have a dialogue across dialogue about some of those ideas. Um, and then I'd want to, I'd like to present also um, examples, uh, both historical and contemporary of land and uh, water based pedagogies um, and education more generally. Um, and then finally, I think there's also, uh, I, I feel like a worthy, you know, conversation about, you know, what this all means for black and brown communities um, and, uh, um, and people of color in general, um, who are a part of school systems throughout uh, the nation. I think there's an important conversation to have um, about that. So um, for, so here's what I'm offering, I guess, to start off uh, for the night. Um, I think that one thing that's important to be able to do to ask the, the difficult and deep questions uh, that will help us interrogate, you know, the work that we do within our field and our field in general um, is to, it's, I think it's easier to do that when it's something else, right? Um, and so in this case, I feel like I, I, I want to offer a, a, an entry into this um, to interrogate our views and orientations of the world. Um, which in many cases and instances are, are, are shaped to reproduce some form of bias. Um, and what I'm going to offer, I guess, is, is, uh, is, some, is a little dive into some of this. Um, one way that we have engaged um, the impacts of colonialism um, and the power of representation in mathematics uh, has been through analyses and explorations of, of, um, of, of the Mercator and Peterson projections and comparing and thinking about, um, you know, what they represent. And I think that one of the places where we've landed in that work is, is that in many ways, you know, what that suggests, you know, the Mercator, you know, projections suggest is, is that, um, is that it, it suggests European superiority uh, to some degree. Um, this particular map uh, suggests something different, perhaps. Um, and so, I want us to take a bit of time to briefly discuss um, in groups. Um, um, I have two things that I would like for you to kind of think about. Um, and one is to view the map and discuss what this representation suggests to you about the world. And then the second question is, does this map change anything about how you see the world uh, today? So we're gonna take about five minutes to kind of think about that. And you're gonna be placed in, in groups and breakout rooms uh, shortly. Uh, to discuss this with your with your with your group, um, and so if you can just quickly jot down the two points, uh, the the point, the first point, like of, of observing and 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 thinking about what you um, what you think the representation suggests, and then the second question, which is, does this map change anything about how you see the world today? So if we can go into breakout rooms for the next uh, five okay. minutes. Okay, the rooms are opening. So I think everybody's back, right? Um, so I, I just wanted to kind of hear um, a bit, you know, some reaction from folks. Um, and maybe folks remembered the room they were in, but um, I, or, or maybe we can just have some volunteers um, just kind of share, two or three volunteers quickly share. In the, uh, in the chat panel, please. In the chat panel. <laughs> yeah, just because it, it, it slows everything down when everyone tries to talk. Mm-hmm. So any, any reactions from anybody in the groups? <laughs> so
So I'm seeing uh, some noticings here. Um, thinking about how we talk about who comes from the global south. Uh, Europe is not the center of the world. We can see so much more water. Uh, we all noticed that water called our attention more in this projection. Uh, map, maker, map, map makers have agendas. Lots of water up front and center. Um, so there, there's a whole lot um, popping up there. Thank you for sharing. Um, I think um, that's definitely, I think, part of, you know, the point. I think also, um, uh, I have a quick question. Are you all still seeing my my slides? No, they have disappeared. Okay. All right. So I will make sure they're back up. <laughs> okay. Okay. So I think um, one of the things um, that I, I think uh, I want to offer uh, that I think is going to be helpful for us as we continue, you know, this conversation is that um, is that one, this concept and idea of, you know, what is up and what is down is, is a human construction, right? It's subjective. We, we, can, we can switch that up and it won't change anything about how we're you know how we how the, how we see the or it won't change anything factually about the world um, because there is no up and there is no down. Um, I think another important point that I want to make is that um, is that maps have been constructed for thousands of years, and in that time there's been various uh, maps and orientations, and some examples of how this you know the maps have varied in terms of their orientation. Um, some of the early maps from the Mediterranean uh, oriented south, uh, some from the Middle East oriented toward the east. And so that's changed throughout time. Um, and then another point is that, is that um, maps uh, also represent more than places. Um, one of the things that's really important, I think, for me as we kind of you know, do this dive into this work um, is that they also suggest places that matter. Uh, from the perspective of those with power or, or the dominant group. And then finally, you know, maps have also been used for other purposes, you know, for trade, for war, for subjugating, um, you know, peoples. And through colonialism, um, uh, these maps have been, you know, spread. And I think, uh, you know, the point here is that there's many possible theories that can explain why we have a northern uh, facing um, or oriented map uh, now, um, but but colonialism has undoubtedly um, uh, contributed to some of the representations that that we now see, and I think there's also an important point, and people keep on referencing the you know the global south, north south, um, is that also those orientations or those references of the north and the south. Um, also carry with them. They're not neutral and carry with them, you know, particular kinds of orientation, uh, um, particular kinds of, of associations. Um, people often associate the North uh, with progress, achievement, and wealth, and the South with dependency and poverty. And so I thought it'd be great to start there to kind of help us kind of begin this, this, uh, this process of, you know, trying to desettle, um, you know, uh, mathematics. Um, I, I'm next going to move on to, um, I guess, a few takeaways that I think are important for us to kind of um, consider and, 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 um, and grapple with uh, today, tomorrow, and whenever it may be necessary, um, uh, is that um, from the perspective of Indigenous people, um, desettling math education, in this case, borrowing uh, from uh, my colleague uh, Megan Bang and their work on desettling settled expectations in science education. It, it, it means that and recognizing that math and math education have served as a tool in colonialism and white supremacy. So I think that's one, one important premise. I think a second one is recognizing uh, is, um, is, is also the need to challenge implicit and explicit claims of Western knowledge systems, ways of knowing and being as superior to indigenous knowledge systems, indigenous ways of knowing and being. 
Um, and in part, you know, what, what I'm going to share today, this move towards decolonizing and indigenous, indigenizing education is a direct challenge to some of these assumptions that I think often we assume to be just neutral or not essential or important in, in the ongoing conversations around the direction of mathematics education. <clears throat> so the two things that I, that I wanna share next. Um, um, are focused on two uh, important, I think, um, uh, points um, that we call for in our work. One is we call for uh, decolonial and anti-racist education that refuses indigenous erasure and deficit models through presencing indigenous people. And what that means to us is that, is that often the references of indigenous people are in the past tense. Um, and often there is very little or no recognition of our contributions uh, to you know, the mathematics world. Um, and, by ref and by presencing um, that it, what we're referring there to is moving beyond the stereotypes that are driven by, by colonialism. And this is the decolonizing part. The second point, which is I think the focus of what I'm gonna be sharing is a move towards what we're suggesting we move towards is a move towards indigenous resurgence. And this refers to the teaching and learning that emerges from and contributes to indigenous youths, uh, youth, families, and community thriving. So the first premise, which is also um, connected to the title of, of this, um, this conversation, is that in order to restore indigenous identities in mathematics teaching and learning, um, this is not possible without being in relationship with land, water, and base. So I think it poses some very interesting challenges to how we think about and conceptualize teaching and learning. I think um, a lot of our, our, um, our designing and our conceptualizations about, of where learning happens are often in classrooms and, uh, and, very, and, and in very few instances in outdoor or community um, you know, context. Um, the other point is, that, that I also want us to kind of talk about is, is, that, um, is that as we think about what it means to restore indigenous identities, I think there's also an important conversation about where and how equity perspectives um, where should they be grounded um, in our conversations? From the perspective of indigenous uh, communities, um, these aims are connected to broader goals of indigenous resurgence, self-determination, autonomy, and nation building. And just to kind of highlight you know, this point, I want to read this short excerpt uh, from Wildcat, where he says, um, if colonization is fundamentally about dispossessing indigenous peoples from land, Decolonization must involve forms of education that reconnect indigenous peoples to land and the social relations, knowledges, and language, languages that arise from the land. Um, so, so what is an equity-oriented aim uh, worth pursuing? I think what, what I'm going to suggest is that there's been important and critical work in the last 25, 30 years uh, that have, uh, that has opened, um, that has created important uh, openings uh, to conceptualize new ways of understanding equity in math education. Um, and I would say that in particular, um, these have been necessary critiques and approaches. Um, and these have been grounded in, in race, culture, power dynamics and intersectional realities. I listed there a few people. I know there's more folks who have contributed to these conversations, but I think there's something worth, um, you know, um, holding about these transitions or these pivot points uh, that have occurred in our field um, from socio from from the psych based uh, perspective to sociocultural perspectives, and not in a linear way. I think there's been in, you know interaction across these as well. But I think to the more so, the more current uh, sociopolitical agendas, 
Um, so I think I, I raise this point to to say that there, the, I, I see these these perspectives as connected um, to the work that I'm that uh, to to indigenous perspectives, um, and I think even then it's necessary to consider equity from indigenous perspectives. So what does it mean to think about equity in mathematics education from an, an indigenous perspective? Um, so we're gonna in a, in a in a bit we're gonna go into a breakout. Um, and but I, I want to kind of share a little bit here and kind of engage a bit of this um, in conversation before you all break out or before we all break out. Um, I, I've listed on one hand um, the general school-based equity aims that that I think are present in our school systems and institutions as as I understand them. Of course, um, you know some may agree or disagree. I think something else to say is that whatever I've listed there is not exhaustive and feel free to fill in um, um, what might actually be playing out in your particular context. I think um, the point here is, is that, and I'm trying to kind of make a contrast in terms of the aims uh, to show that they're quite different um, from my perspective. Um, so I, I wanna kind of just read some from the left-hand side where I, I show the school-based equity aims. Um, I think part of you know, the, the research and the practice in this area um, are is is there, there's quite a bit about what it means to have access to school-based curricula. There's also a focus and an emphasis on classroom practices and routines that promote participation. Also, an interest in attending to the needs of racially, linguistically diverse learners. Um, and then also, I think some of the other points, and and I think this is where I'm kind of bringing in some of my ideas is there's also some restriction in terms of the mathematical content and the intellectual opportunities that, that learners get to engage. Um, and in particular, I'm talking about you know, community context. And then finally, um, I think, um, and, and this is up for debate, I think um, you know, depending on you know, where, um, you know, where you are in terms of your own development, um, and your engagement around you know, whether you see what plays out in school mathematics as Western only or whether you see the different contributions. Um, but I do want to say is that, is that you know, one of the aims is inclusion of non-dominant communities into dominant paradigms and views of the world and reality. And by that, I mean that there's a, there's a, a constrained um, pathway uh, as to what utility mathematics can have um, for non-dominant groups. Um, I think that's restricted. And so on the other hand, what I'm offering is the other ways that we think about it uh, from indigenous perspectives. Um, decolonize, decolonization and indigenous resurgence uh, for us means engaging in millennial practices that contribute to community well-being. And this includes making and other uh, cultural practices. Some of you may be familiar with some of the work that I do. Um, and, and some of this involves engaging in weaving and clay making and other forms of, of making uh, within, um, within the context of our camps that we organize. Um, this also is about land and water-based pedagogies, observation, walking, harvesting for the purpose of making medicine, getting food, harvesting food, or taking part in ceremony. Um, and then also, I think the other part is that it's not just about um, participating in cultural practices, it's, it's participating and engaging in cultural practices for the purpose of sustainability, self-determination, autonomy, and nation building. So as you can see, I think one place where I'm going is that the goals or the aims of one particular approach seemed, I think, a, a lot more ambitious and um, then perhaps the ones that we are calling for and on in, in school-based context. Um, and then, um, so I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to, we're going to transition into another small breakout um, for about six, seven minutes. I think this one may take a little bit more for folks to kind of um, dive into, but, but, um, but I have two questions that I think are, are worth, you know, our time. Um, the first is, is how well do the aims of school-based equity attend to the broader goals of decolonization and indigenous resurgence. And the second question to think about in your small group is, which aims on the left column 
uh, have potential to be compatible with the aims of decolonization and indigenous resurgence. So I, I, I want to be clear, and I'm not suggesting that, that school-based equity aims are not important or worthy. Um, I think the point for me is to, is to ask, you know, have we been thinking about those? And, and how, do, how, how do we um, negotiate those particular tensions that we see? Um, so I'm hoping folks can make a, uh, have a conversation and take a deeper dive into this. Um, and I think we're going to do about six, seven minutes, and then we'll come back. Okay. Opening the rooms. Thank you. I think folks are back. Um, and so I, I, I wanted to open up um, a few folks for a few folks to share um, some thoughts, some ideas, you know, where, where did this conversation kind of land you? What were some of the tensions you discussed and, and or the free reframings that you're considering as you as we, you know, think about um, the questions that I posed there. So um, oh, I think I, I can't see my chat. We lost your uh, video. Yeah, I, I, I was um, asking if folks can share. I'm asking for some folks to share, and I couldn't see that when I was with the um, PowerPoint. So I'll go back into the PowerPoint in a bit. So any any thoughts, any, any conversations? I see um, um, Heather, you want to? share publicly what what um what what that uh, say a little bit more about what you are sharing in the chat sure um so and in connecting from the left side to the right side what what does it mean i think we need to have a broader perspective of what does it mean to uh, participate and have those routines established so connecting to the community and seeing them as resources and make that a regular routine practice of engaging and what that include consider that participation like that's a vital aspect of the instruction is participation um, of communities and the elders as resources thank you um i also see joan you want to share we were, sure we were talking and saying that without intentional without paying close attention to it you can't you or the the goals of decolonization and indigenous resurgence aren't going to happen on their own within the general school-based equity aims. So you, if, if there's any chance of them happening at all, it has to be very intentional and part of the original design and would require a paradigm shift in, you know, where does education happen? I mean, you can't be out gathering and walking and harvesting if you're in a classroom, um, but so much of our, our uh, definition of education is just restricted to that um, very arbitrary kind of um, barren space of what happens in the classroom. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. And I think this is a worthy uh, conversation to continue. Um, I want to next um, transition to um, one of the next uh, points. Um, I, I, I want to follow uh, by reading uh, to you um, an account uh, from the Chronicle of Peru uh, by a Spaniard named uh, Pedro de Ciesa de Leon in 1553. Um, and I, I, I want to read this, um, and some of you may be familiar with this. I've talked about it in other situations and other talks, but I think it's, it's important uh, to hear um, from those who document it, um, you know, that some of the perceptions and understanding. So what I'm going to do is I'll share um, a historical example, and then I'm going to kind of jump to more contemporary ways that we're thinking about this work. Um, and so I want to start off with this particular um, um, account. Um, and, and Pedro de Ciesa de Leon states, these were long ropes made of knotted cords, and those who were accountants and, un and understood the arrangement of these knots could by their means give an account of the expenditure and of other things during a long course of years. On these knots, they counted from one to 10, and from 10 to 100, and from 100 to 1,000. Each ruler 
of a province was provided with accountants who were called Kipucamayos, and by these knots, they kept account of what tribute was to be paid in the district with respect to silver, gold, cloth, flocks, down to the firewood and other minute details. And then he goes on to describe the Kipu as a method of knowing and understanding what had been received from the contributions in the provinces, uh, what provisions were stored on the routes that the king would take with his army or when he was visiting the provinces how much was in each place of deposit, how much was delivered out. After the conquest, when, when Spanish troops devastated the land, the Indian chiefs assembled and by means of the quipus ascertained which province had lost more than another and balanced the losses between them. And then he continues, and I'll end here. Incredulous res uh, respecting the system of counting, and although I heard it described, I held the, the greater part of the story to be fabulous. But when I was at Marsavilla in the province of Shausha, I asked the Lord of Huacarapora to explain it in such a way as that my mind might be satisfied and that I might be assured that it was true and accurate. He ordered his servants to bring the quipus and in this Lord, and, and as this Lord was a native and a man of good understanding, he proceeded to make the thing clear to me. He told me to observe that all that he, for his part, had delivered to the Spaniards from the time that the governor, Don Francisco Pizarro, arrived in the valley, was duly noted down without any fault or omission. Thus I saw the accounts for the gold, the silver, and the, the cloths, the corn, sheep, and other things, so that in truth I was quite astonished. And so I, I, I decided to kind of share this particular account um, because it shows in many ways that, that, um, that in these first and early encounters, um, the people who were colonizing actually understood the complexity of what was being described and, and what they were observing. And the point for me sharing this particular you know, image is to kind of um, um, land the point um, that, that in the, the, land the point that culture and mathematics, um, in this case, come together in a single device, right? And it's a mathematical device that as you know described by the by the um by by the the uh the colonizer um describes you know the the functions of it right for counting uh the size of communities dates of ceremonies agricultural cycles and on and on and on um and i think the other part is uh, is is i think it it also helps for for me, it helps me um see uh the ways in which land based the ideas of land and water based pedagogies are not a new thing these are since time immemorial practices that existed then um, and in this case you know the kipu is one of those devices that uh, emerged from a particular type of relationship that that the uh, inca had um, in their in their environment and in their um, and the intimate relationships that they created um, with the other living things in their in their particular place. Um, and lastly, what I'll say about this example um, is that it is also, um, I think one way that we can begin to kind of reframe some of our understandings is that is that we think about computers and the technologies of the present day as kind of being uniquely, you know, of the present. Um, when in actuality, we can actually attribute a lot of the understandings about computing um, and storing to these particular technologies. So I think we need to reference more and more um, that this is not just weaving. Um, it's not only weaving technology, it's mathematical, and it's actually a precursor of computers and computing. Um, the other example that I want to, the, the other example that I want to share and I'll say less about this because um, there are we do have papers for this. Um, is is our work in the Pacific Northwest uh, in collaboration with my colleague uh, Megan Bang? Um, in the last eight years, for the last eight years, eight years uh, we've been organizing um, an indigenous ice team camp. And part of the work that we do in this in this camp is, in essence, actually living out um, land and water uh, based uh, pedagogies. Um, and a lot of the way that we frame our, our work um, throughout the weeks that we do this camp is, is stepping out of, 
you know, the more Western based ideas of what it means to be in relationships. So often when we think about relationships and what counts and what matters, uh, we're strictly thinking about human relationships. And I think that one of the things that, that this camp allows us to do is to reframe and to think through stories uh, originating from various communities, native indigenous communities uh, here in the Northwest and also Midwest and South and Central um, uh, America. Um, and we work from those stories to be able to kind of talk about landscapes and spaces. Um, and so um, in one of the things that you will see in the, in the articles that we've written is um, two articles that I want to kind of um, turn your attention to is, um, is, is that we conceptualize and we understand mathematics as not being a singular um, um, discipline or domain as, it, as is normally seen in school context, right? We go to schools and we attend schools and we see uh, mathematics as its own content area. In very few cases do we see it in relationship with other uh, academic disciplines. Um, in this context, mathematics emerges and is a part and weaved into a larger uh, um, and broader knowledge system. And so when we, so for, for me, it's difficult to kind of say, here's, you know, the, I can point out and say here, here's where math is emerging, but it never originates only as mathematics as its own, as its own, you know, academic discipline. It's always in relationship. And, and what you'll see in these articles is, you know, one, in one of the articles, we kind of illustrate and show the, the ways in which it shows up in the making activities, specifically in clay making. Um, and then the other thing that I want to share with you all is, is, um, is we also have a website where we share some of these um, activities um, in the indigenouseducationtools.org website. And so you'll see that there. Um, feel free to access the materials there. We, those are some of the actual prompts and, and organizers that we use to kind of help us launch into uh, some of the, the walking uh, pedagogies uh, some of the land-based and water-based uh, pedagogies that we that we engage throughout the, the summer camp. Um, and then um, one last thing that I that I feel is important, and I want to kind of end here. Um, and I I want to end here and also open up the discussion. I, I think um, I, as I thought a lot about the you know what what's the implication and and why are indigenous knowledge systems and knowledge of land and water. Uh, based pedagogy is important and, you know, how do they connect and relate to other communities? I think one of the places that I first go to is, is, um, is that we're in a very important uh, moment now um, where it's important that we narrate uh, stories that are accountable to different communities, right? And so one way that I've kind of been conceptualizing through some of my work uh, back home with uh, folks in in, um, in Michoacan uh, through Comuna Purépecha is, is there's a concept and an idea uh, that originates uh, from activists and uh, indigenous uh, uh, community leaders in, in Mexico. And, and one of the ways that, you know, people have been trying to kind of coalesce and think across communities is through this idea of um, what in Spanish um, are referenced as proyecto de muerte. In English, translates to death projects or projects of death. And in essence, you know, what, what um, you know, community members are describing is that, is that some of these projects, like mining projects um, and uh, uh, fracking, um, have particular kinds of impacts, not only on human health, but also on more than human and also threaten the cosmological worlds of different rural communities. So the ways that communities are organized um, and go about their lives is also threatened. Um, and when I was thinking about that, I thought a lot about, you know, that's not unique to, you know, the rural communities down in Mexico, um, you know, where I'm from. It's also a part of the reality in this particular context. And so the place that it took me, um, it took me to think a lot about um, the water crisis in Flint. Um, and I think, um, you know, water um, is such an important and essential part of our lives as humans. Um, it made me think a lot about, about you know, so, so how do we, um, 
how do how, what's what's the connection or how do we push our field math education uh, to consider the realities and life experiences of of, of communities that are under assault? Um, and I went to this uh, this particular example because I think there's a there's some great opportunity uh, to connect some of those equity aims you know that are school based to you know the the uh, the moves towards decolonization and um, and uh, resurgence work. Um, and I first and 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 it made me go back to a particular experience that I had um, at MSRI at Berkeley. And so I want to thank you know my colleague you know Julia Aguirre and her collaborators, you know, who in a professional setting uh, were able to bring, um, you know, this very important issue uh, around water and how it was impacting um, the Black community in Flint, in, uh, in particular the Black community. And so I, I just wanted to turn to your attention to, you know, the work they've done. Um, and, and I think it's important to have the task and they did that, they shared, we all engaged in it. Um, but I think even more important, is bringing it to those particular kinds of spaces um, where, where there hasn't been that connection and that relationship uh, with communities. Um, something that I listened to and heard in, in you know, one of the small group sessions um, that I was a part of you know, in, this, in this last hour, um, and I think is very pertinent to you know, the point here as well, um, is, is the importance of, of designing um, opportunities to engage families and communities as a central as central participants in these processes and in these um, in these lessons and these units that that people want to take on I think um, I, I as I think a lot about the work uh, that I'm engaged in uh, you know back home and here with native communities um, none of it actually can happen uh, with just the the participation of, of researchers and, and educators, formal educators. Um, a lot of it largely happens uh, because there's been explicit and intentional openings uh, for community members to play a part in those processes. So um, with that, I'm, I'm gonna stop and I'm hoping to um, open this up for uh, questions, um, comments, and just a conversation um, you know, around some of the ideas and concepts that I've brought to the table this evening. And I put my information there as well, if folks want to reach out. So I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna get out of this so I, so that I can see the chat because I don't think I can see the chat when I'm here. Oh, there you go. I can actually see it now. So comments, reactions, um, questions. So Florence, I see you have a question. Would you, do you want to ask a question, Florence? No, I'm sorry. I don't think I did. Did I push the hand? Okay, <laughs> I, thought, I saw somebody in is the chat's just kind of flying. And so I saw somebody mention that you had a question. So. Um, no, I was I was just thinking a lot about your talk, and and I had posted that, you know, um, <clears throat> given the conversation of decolonizing and indigenization or indigenous resurgence, it's also to question and to think about um, what mathematics can we learn from land if land is our teacher. So so to actually be studying in a way, the land, the way that our knowledge, indigenous knowledge holders have studied it for thousands of years. And actually from that, in that notion that you brought forward, um, mathematics emerges in that interaction in the study. So um, I was thinking, well, what kinds of mathematics would we include now in school curriculum to begin to, um, question the dominant discourse of it being sort of a Western mathematics. Yes, I think um, I, I th thank you. Appreciate that comment and, and, and question. I think um, it's a very, you know, provocative question. I think in some of the work that I've been engaging 
um, with some of the tribes out here in um, in Washington State. Um, there is what it, um, is called um, since the since time immemorial curriculum, um, which is a, a a curriculum that was designed by uh, communities, by Native communities in the state of Washington. And it's a requirement for everybody to actually participate in some kind of course uh, work around it. Um, and um, one of the powerful pieces that came out of some of the work, you know, from the community is that um, they they never actually negate it. They, they've always, the, I guess the conversation that I had with folks is that they never negated or, or didn't see the importance of school-based math. Uh, the only thing that they were saying is, is um, or one of the things that we're saying is, is um, that's not all that explains some of the things that we actually live and experience in our daily life. And so they started talking about fishing practices. They started talking about um, other forms of, or, of, of organization in their community. And so for me, what it, what it, I guess what it reminds me is, is that, um, you know, like the, the since time immemorial curriculum is, is like a starting point for people to kind of think about and, and not contribute to the erasure of indigenous people. But, but as we are speaking, uh, some of these practices are being lived out and whether people call it mathematics or not is all dependent on who's living it. Um, and so, you know, going back to the point of, you know, the, this kind of cross conversation, um, you know, th there was a very powerful, um, you know, example that emerged in one of the conversations around science, actually. Um, and when they were talking about adaptation, um, they were connecting that to one of the stories in their particular tribe uh, that talked about how and how and why, you know, Turtle got his spots on his back. And it was it was it was an opportunity for kids to kind of move between, you know, if you want to if you want to call it this worlds, right, like the world that's explaining adaptation to a particular way of thinking about, um, you know, the, sci the scientific processes from a more Western-based conception, and then a story that's actually narrating its own explanation for the how that happens. And, and, and the difference is what happens when, you know, teachers and educators actually value those two explanations as valid and not kind of say like, well, that's just a story. No, it's a story with particular kind of knowledge that's been passed on over millennia that holds a very important place, you know, for, for, for that community. So that's where it took me. Um, and so I, I appreciate that, that, um, that, that, that comment question. Um, I think I also see a question by Heather. I was just mentioning about this idea of the healing aspect of um, engaging in these pedagogies and how important and critical that is um, given our current reality and mm -hmm. how that could also have um, an impact on our communities. Yes, definitely. I, I'd encourage you to um, look up some of the, the um, activities that we published in our website. Um, one of the things that we were not able to hold our ice team camp this, uh, this summer um, but we did some virtual and we designed, you know, these activities with that in mind that we would not be able to see each other. Um, and so part of it is, you know, we, we, we published them so that people could go out and have some of these conversations. And one of the things that we kept on hearing from families um, over the course of the three, four weeks that we connected, you know, for one, one hour to kind of talk about what people had observed and done um, was exactly that point. And we've also documented that in our research, right? Like, um, this is not just, um, you know, a good way to kind of develop, uh, you know, a thriving identity for, for Native and Indigenous youth. Um, there's also a healing, you know, aspect to this as well. Um, and that's what we kept on hearing with, with folks. And, and, I, and I've also kind of run into articles in other spaces, you know, where, where people are talking about, you know, now they're doing these scientific studies, you know, where where, um, you know, people are doing what they call forest bathing and, you know, kind of doing that because there's evidence that, you know, uh, from, you know, Western science that kind of shows that people's emotions um, actually change and, and, and improve uh, just by being out in the outdoor in the forest. And so um, we know these things to be true. Um, and so to kind of see it, you know, kind of support it in other st studies and spaces is, is actually just confirming, right? 
Um, any last comments, questions? Uh, I have a question. I've been thinking about um, like how to have land-based lessons as, like during distance learning. And I was just wondering if you had any thoughts um, on students who are in very urban settings that don't have access to um, you know, plants and forests and stuff uh, because my students, yeah, they, they just, they really don't have access to, to that. Yeah, so I, that, that's a really provocative question, I guess, when, when you ask that question. Um, I would say and argue that the urban spaces in which we're living in are layered on top of land that look very different, right? And so I think, so one of the things, you know, here in Seattle where we hold the camp, um, uh, we do have spaces, you know, green spaces, you know, quite a, you know, several and many throughout the city. Um, but but I think that's that's um, that's something that we also press on you know on, on students thinking uh, and youth thinking is is um, you know what may have what might have these lands look like and I encourage I would encourage you and others you know tonight to go out and take a walk around your neighborhood uh, wherever it may be and to you know think about you know those questions like think about I wonder what this place may have looked like 50 years ago 100 years ago and to kind of have those you know reflections about place and and uh, and how that's transformed as a consequence of colonialism, um, and I think um, I think you'll find something rich about thinking about it that way, and I know it's not the same way, but I think you know land and waters have been transforming you know across you know time, and so so I think it's a it's a provocative thing I think uh, to kind of consider those those things right like is this you know it, it, is a space. The space that we're on, whether it's urban and there's concrete on it, um, is land. And somebody lived there 100, 200, 300, 500 years ago. And so the question is, you know, how did they make use of this space? You know, what may have been, um, you know, the, their sources of food and shelter and, and how did they develop culture out of being in these particular places? I think there's, there's some provocative questions and, and actually I think some of the, um, the prompts in the activities kind of get you to think about that and 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 that's kind of connected and related to some of the the, the walking pedagogies that, that we do. All right, so based off of time, we're gonna go ahead and wrap things up. Thank you so much, uh, Filiberto, for sharing. And thank you, Sylvia and Todos, for your partnership in this endeavor. And thank you to those of you who joined us this evening. As a reminder, this webinar has been recorded and will be available on Casio Education's YouTube channel and on Todos' website. If you need a certificate of attendance, please respond to the follow-up email you will receive tomorrow. Uh, be sure to join us next Tuesday, October 27th, for our last webinar in this series this year on equity in education with Dr. Marilyn Strachan. Thank you guys all, and have a good night. Thank you all.